My name is Bill Shireman. I'm with a group called Future 500. We are a nonprofit that um, uh, builds alliances across traditional boundaries. We bring corporations together with activist groups. We bring the right together with the left uh, to advance solutions to climate, to water, to recycling, and to human rights. And I'm sitting next to one of my heroes, uh, Bob Inglis, who has truly uh, uh, dedicated himself to uh, uh, solutions that are consistent with conservatism and that are consistent with conservation and uh, environmental, con environmental conservation. And I think it's incredibly important for us to recognize that we have allies on all sides on these issues and that it is important to protect those allies and to make sure that in their places they have the ability to carry out their work. It is extremely difficult in the Republican Party right now with the influence of a segment of the Tea Party, which is dominant in that Tea Party, but that closes off discussion of issues like climate. And the folks within the Republican Party and within the business community that want to be pro-climate are sometimes tossed to the dogs as they do. They don't have the kind of protection that they need, and we need to, to provide them with that. Two years ago, the voters, in their uh, wisdom, tossed out uh, the uh, administration of George W. Bush and brought a new team under President Barack Obama dedicated to change. Two weeks ago, the voters, in their evolving wisdom, tossed out the change agents in exchange for a new set of change agents, almost 100 new members of Congress, 80 of them Republicans, a 60-vote change over uh, in that one election. Many in the sustainability movement are depressed and disillusioned at that change. But I am not, and I know many of you are not either. Part of the reason that I am not is that in the work that we do at Future 500, we've recognized two realities in the process of change of which we are all a part. And reality number one is that we have allies in places that we have never imagined. We have allies in places that we have never imagined. Allies in business, in labor, on the right, even within the Tea Party, that have political power and political influence that can pull us over the finish line and can bring us some of the policies that are key to sustainability. And the second is that we have power that we have never used, power that we have left on the table time and time again. And with full respect for Congressman Filner, I think his name was, in the last session, I do not believe that we will find that power simply by trying to work harder to mobilize young voters who didn't come out this last time. If they didn't come out, they didn't come out because they were not energized internally enough. They did not have enough internal motivation to do that. When the 1960s happened and when the changes that he talked about happened, it was because that passion for change was built in to the students. There was no top-down structure that forced them to come out and vote. They were pulling. They were pulling that. They were providing the energy. And we can do that now. I learned this in a strange way from a guy named Bill Coors. Way back when I was head of an environmental group in California, we were trying to pass a simple little bottle bill, uh, nickel deposit on beverage containers. And Bill Coors, I, he was one of the opponents of this law. And I was trying to figure out how we're going to pass this law against the evil opposition that we were facing. Coors was head of Coors Brewing Company. His brother Joe had been a, a co-founder of the Heritage Foundation. And everybody told me, they're never going to go along with it. Anything they say nice about recycling has got to be just greenwashing. They're an evil, profit-hungry corporation. I called Bill Coors, as well as the head of other companies, sat down with him, and basically he began to strategize with me how to pass a bottle bill. And, uh, and it was astonishing to me to have, it wasn't as astonishing as, as you might imagine, because I really thought that there were allies on the other side, and indeed there were. Bottom line, Here's what he says about oil. Oil won't last forever. For that, we are lucky. Petroleum dependence is a risky, unreliable crutch that drives global insecurity, depletion, and pollution. Fortunately, our success doesn't come from fossil fuels. It comes from innovation, and there's plenty of that left. The technologies to free us from petroleum are at hand. Now, that's what Bill Coors says. 
Coors helped us to undermine the business opposition that we were facing in California and gave us the clue that we needed to how to win that, uh, win that opposition and pull them into our favor. And I'm gonna lay out a strategy, if you will, for passing a price on carbon that builds on that lesson. But it's a lesson that we've pulled together on in a wide variety of issues across the globe in the work that we've been doing uh, ever since that time. We managed to pass, by the way, a California bottle bill with core support, with retailer support, uh, in an unprecedented uh, in an unprecedented fashion. For the last year and a half, we have been convinced that the cap and trade measure that was in Congress, while it did seem to have greater political uh, potential at the beginning, was not the best way for us to proceed as a nation or as a movement, and that in all likelihood it would be defeated, uh, particularly at this moment in in history that it was too dependent on the finance sector, which had been thoroughly undermined uh, by itself, and that it was too costly and too uncertain uh, to reach the goals that it set forth. And we felt during this time that while it was important that some groups advance cap and trade, it was much more important that we build a plan B coalition. So for the last year and a half, we've been building a plan B coalition for a price on carbon talking to every stakeholder group that we can reach, on the right, on the left, in the middle, in business, in labor, in, in environment. And in the course of those discussions, we've developed two principles which have been endorsed by the uh, Price Carbon Campaign and most of the groups that are involved today. But these two principles are also very broadly supported within the business community, uh, within the labor community, within uh, the progressive community, the environmental justice community, and they, we believe, are the principles that can be supported by a very broad coalition to bring a price on carbon. Number one, a price on carbon, of course. Number two, a dividend or tax reduction to consumers. There's some detail in there, but that's the fundamental uh, two principles on which we can build a coalition that has the capability to win. What's the potential? What are the elements of that coalition? Well, we think that there is a dynamic that needs to be played upon here. That, of course, we obviously need to have Republican support now. And we have an angry NGO activist community that wants to take action to drive climate protection. We need to channel the strengths that we have to produce the outcome that we need. Now, there are many in the activist community that want to and, and uh, you know, that, that are ready for direct action, that are ready for civil disobedience. They are angry that nothing has been done and they want to take it to the streets. And we totally understand that. If that is done, the direction of that activism needs to be very focused. Activists uh, uh, do not win votes in Congress at this point. More and more letters, more and more phone calls, more and more direct action directed toward politicians is not going to accomplish the goal. But we have a lot of major corporations out there within which there are quiet supporters of what we want to advance. Some public supporters, Nike has been great, very, very public. But a lot of companies that quietly support a, 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 a carbon tax shift, but they need a little pressure, some friendly pressure, and perhaps some you know, more tense pressure over time. That's where the NGO community needs to focus its attention, and specifically on the retail sector and on the brands. Because one thing that we've learned in history is that the brand name companies and the retail companies who are at the top of the supply chain, who have the most, who have the buying power, they are the ones that can uh, determine the political positions of all the companies that sell to them. These are the folks that spend the most money on the most companies. So if you want something done, you go to a Walmart, you go to a Target, you go to a major brand, a top 10, top 20 brand, and you build them into your coalition. And there's a tug and there's a, there's a push and pull that goes on here. There's a you know, recognition on the part of some within the companies that they need to be receiving a lot of letters, a lot of phone calls, they need to be getting a unified ask from the progressive community. But that's where to put the effort, is in reaching out and driving support by the, the, the biggest buyers in the world uh, who need this. And many of them support it already, but they can't come out publicly. So they need your help, they need our help. And then secondly, you need the Republicans. 
in talking to all of these stakeholders, here's the here's what we feel needs to happen politically for us to win. We need an, a, a, an alliance that brings together from these groups, you can see the groups on the left that support a price, a price on carbon and some of the leaders. We need three major corporate sectors of support. We need to first check off a top 10 brand. So who would be a top 10 brand that we could check off? So I have a little check mark there as a, as a hint. Um, but, and we already have that. Nike has come forward, signed the bicep principles and brought with them a number of other companies like Starbucks that have taken progressive stands. So we need those top 10 brand companies to come along with us. Then we need uh, to target, so to speak, a top five retailer and put them on the wall. Art. And they can generate the support that we need from uh, some of the National Association of Manufacturers members that have stood uh, against this over time. They have the capacity in the states that are both Democratic and Republican to generate support on the part of the politicians there. And then we need to put an X on a non-coal energy provider of some sort. So we need the support of folks in the energy business that are not tied to coal, that are not dependent on coal. And there are many companies, the, those companies that have invested more in natural gas than in coal or in tar sands. These are companies who would be advantaged in the marketplace by a carbon tax shift. And those companies also are sitting on the sidelines waiting for the right kind of pressure from the progressive and the environmental community so that they can come in on this as well. I, yeah, let me just go, let me just go on. I was gonna tell you here, but here's a couple of the heroes that I think we can, we can rely on here. Oh my gosh, look at the size of that. He is quite, but you know, I, I heard, I heard uh, Congressman Vilmer's uh, message but I think that we cannot afford to be a partisan movement in advancing climate protection. We cannot afford to demonize every Republican or the Republican Party or pretend that this guy is the only Republican that wants to support climate protection. There are plenty of Republicans that want to support climate protection. Let me tell you, I've talked to a lot of them, but they are scared to death. And there are, there are Republican think tanks that would like to support a carbon tax shift but they don't get the money from their funders if they start talking about climate. We have to protect these folks. We have to protect these folks. We have to recognize them, bring them into the coalition and listen to the good points that they make about things like taxes because we are not gonna get anywhere either if we're out there saying taxes need to be raised. Maybe they need to be raised. Fine, you know, let somebody else carry that. But if we, if we, want, to, uh, if we want to protect the climate, we have to recognize that there are diverse constituencies they need to be brought together. Here's George Schultz, another major Republican who helped us in California to beat back Proposition 23, which would have gutted the state's climate action. Republicans can be a part of this. We need Republicans that have the courage or they have the reputation to come forward on that. We need to reframe this conversation from a Republican perspective, national security, job creation, technology, tax cuts, global competitiveness, and so on. We need to send the right messengers. Again, this is not the, um, the, uh, the progressive community uh, 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 filling the offices of Tea Party Congre members of Congress. The progressives can be helpful in this campaign, but it's gonna be primarily because they have much greater influence over the corporate sector than they do over the Tea Party in Congress, or even you know, uh, Republicans overall. They have the capacity to bring aboard major corporate support. They don't have the capacity to bring aboard Tea Party support. So let's focus the activist community where they can do, uh, do the best job. And don't attack uh, Republicans who already support the bill. Lindsey Graham last year took more political risks on this uh, bill. Uh, he was supporting the wrong bill, the cap and trade approach, but nevertheless, he, he, he stuck his career on the line to be a leading Republican for climate protection, and people like him do need to have protection. So, um, so we need to talk about issues like the transfer of $7 trillion of wealth from the United States and the Western world to the to nations that are opposed to our interests in the last generation. 
We need to recognize that that's a major issue. We need to talk to folks like Set America Free that, that uh, the congressman uh, mentioned uh, in his remarks, uh, who say, you know, we're bankrolling our enemies with our dependence on oil, that we can't drill our way out. We're transferring trillions of dollars to countries uh, that are opposed to our interests more than our defense budget. Uh, that we're essentially extracting a tax of $1,600 a year per person in the United States right now because of our dependence on that oil, and that's destabilizing the world. These are the kinds of points that can be made by Republicans who support a carbon tax shift. They need to be part of it. So we're not going to get a majority of Republican votes, you know, regardless in the Congress. But if we concentrate on a strategy that brings aboard Republicans as well as the business community into a coalition led by progressives and others in the environmental community. There are 10 to 12 senators in the Senate right now that we think we can potentially bring aboard. But we need to do these three things. Mobilize the left to secure corporate support. Number two, build a strong GOP support base in the next two years that's based on national security and fiscal conservatism. We need to organize in those districts quietly so that we have those supporters. We don't need to make a lot of noise about it because people are going to shut us down if we do, but we need to have that base of support in every Republican district and state so that the, so that the representatives there know that there are major constituents that want to have this happen. And they don't have to lose their seats in 2012, but they do have to vote for this in 2013. That's the message to deliver. And then we need to mobilize all three for a win in 2013. If we can do that as a movement, we can win this. But we have to be strategic about it. We have to know what we're doing. Two years ago, a year and a half ago, after Barack Obama was elected, I went to two conferences that were happening simultaneously in Washington, D.C. One was the Power Shift Conference. 12,000 active young people, including my daughter, who were there to, to welcome the Obama administration and wait for climate protection to happen. It was tremendously inspiring. But what it lacked was a real strategy for where to direct that movement. There was too much, too much honoring of the new president who was going to bring the change that we had all waited for. Right across town, there was the CPAC conference at the same time, Conservative Political Action uh, Conference. I went to both conferences. At CPAC, they were ready. They had the lingo down. They had the strategies down. They were going to destroy this new presidency, and they were going to destroy what they called at that time cap and tax. They were going to destroy it. Now, they succeeded in that, not because they had more enthusiasm, not because they had truth on their side, but because they had a better strategy that they carried out. We need to have a smart strategy. We've got the potential. Now we need to organize it. Thank you very much. I'd like to pass it on to the